Well, I'm here with uh, Mitchell Linden interviewing uh, for the Timeless Film Festival on July 8th. Uh, Mitchell, nice to see you. Um, I worked on one of Mitchell's, or both of Mitchell's short films that are in the film festival, um, so I'm very excited to talk more and probably I'll learn more about them as well. So thank you for being here. Thanks um, for having me and showing my films. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear what were some of your biggest inspirations for, um, first let's talk about Pretzel Logic. Um, so what were some of your biggest inspirations for Pretzel Logic? So Pretzel Logic's kind of interesting that I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and my parents, I used to call them the Rat Pack chapter of Cleveland. They were, you know, this kind of generation of first generation Americans, and they were gonna do the American dream full on. So they, they partied on weekends, the house would be full of smoke and cocktails. And so they had all these friends that would come over and I would study them, I, you know, as a kid and I'd watch them. and. As time passed, I realized that half of them were criminals. I mean, they weren't like full on, like they would never identify themselves as criminals, but they were into money laundering and they were into pornography. They were into uh, transporting stolen goods. I mean, they were into all kinds of stuff, but around the house, they were just an other families. So these people were the inspiration. I thought if I could take these people that were just like, typical family people in the Midwest, but they always had their hand in something else um, and bring them to sort of a contemporary setting. So I kind of married those people with my friends who are now, you know, in their 60s and, you know, they're still deadheads and stoners. And I thought, well, if I mash these two kinds of people up, these are the characters that sort of inspired this film. And that and the fact that I grew up in a neighborhood that was sort of the first suburb out of the city of Cleveland. And when I was a kid, it was going through major transformations. It, Cleveland is very sort of pocket-oriented of various ethnic groups. And my neighborhood, which is mostly Irish and Jewish, suddenly became Irish, Jewish, and African-American. And I thought, like, the mashup that was going on of these cultures, both, you know, on the negative side of the tensions that emerged, as well as on sort of the, the cultural exchange on the positive side, was really interesting. So all that kind of thing when I grew up was what informed pretzel logic. Okay, great. Um, and if you were to, um, I know you're planning to expand on this project in the fall, if you were to like change or adapt anything about this concept, how would you change it? So, you know, the scene doesn't tell the whole story because it's really an ensemble film. So it follows uh, about eight different characters and they're, they're young, they're old, they're um, wealthy, they're struggling, they're kids, they're seniors. So it's, it's this mashup of characters and as far as like that scene, the, the thing that I changed since I shot that was the ending. And I don't want to sort of say how it ends now, right? but where it goes now, the way it's been rewritten is it becomes a fist fight. Mm -hmm. Because I just love the idea of two men approaching the age of 70, getting into a fist fight, and, and men who grew up basically as brothers. So they, they fight kind of the way brothers fight with headlocks and nuggies and only they've got like no wind left in them. So 30 <laughs> seconds into it, they're both exhausted. And um, they kind of pull their punches because they kind of love each other, but they're really angry, so they're going at it. So yeah, so that's kind of the biggest change to that scene. That yeah. So you have a lot of experience in the film industry. Mitchell's worked with BBC before and all kinds of amazing productions. Do you have any experience with stunt work? Um, or is it, and if it's like a pioneer like thing, like I mean, that's even better, you know. I mean, I've certainly worked on several films. It's funny because I've done like everything, literally yeah. everything, <laughs> except for caterer on a film set. I mean, I've done special effects, makeup. I've been a union editor, director. I've done, uh, you name it. I've done it. Shot stuff. The only thing that I haven't done is like kind of stunt stuff, but. 
that's cool. That's yeah, embrace it. Something yeah. new to yeah. To I love with. it. Yeah. I love it. So if you um and we love this cast, right? I mean, it's just an amazing cast that you've put together. Yeah. Um, but if you were to film Pretzel Logic with like a dream cast, who would it have in it? Or who maybe do you take yeah. inspiration from for these roles? So yeah, you're right. I do love the cast I worked with, so I would definitely want them involved. Other people I've thought about, you know, there's people of my generation that I've always thought are amazing. Um, Forrest Whitaker, Steve Buscemi, uh, J.K. Simmons, people like that. I would love to get into it. Two women that I think are really interesting that both grew up in my neighborhood is Deborah Winger and Sean Young, who I think to attract one of them to it um, as like a, a story of my neighborhood would be yeah. really cool. What advice would you give to like a first time filmmaker creating a short independent film? What advice would you give to them? Yeah, I have so many things there. <laughs> um, learn the craft and learn the technology because there's a ton of craft and a ton of technology in making a film and everything you don't know is a tool missing from your toolbox and a piece of your story that you're going to hand off to somebody else. So I, I've, I've worked with a lot of directors that are terrible. A lot of films I've worked on, the, the most incompetent person on the set is the director. And that works because if you have really strong DP, he'll block the shots, he'll make it look good. Your production designer will think through the look, the editor will tell the story, the composer will enhance the story. So all these people will get a movie and you can put your name on the end and you'll yeah. have made a movie. But if you have a story you want to tell, you really have to know what's the difference between shooting with a 50 and a 200. What is color grading and what is the, the tone of your film? How does sound work? Think about your story without pictures, if you just had to think of it and telling it with sound, what's going on? Are there kids playing? Are there dogs barking? How do these sounds heighten what you're trying to say with these characters in this story at th this moment? So it's, it's a complex set of tools that you have, both in terms of technique and in t terms of technology. And again, if you don't know how to if you don't really understand all that the tools in your toolbox, somebody else is going to take that for you. Yeah, that's great. Um, how did you find your cast and crew? Tell me about that process. So I hadn't shot anything in a long time. You know, my I had kids. I was a music video director for a long time. Worked on a lot of films, edited television, and then. Through serendipity, somebody said to me, this internet thing is going to be huge. So I left L.A., moved up to the Bay Area in the mid-90s. I started consulting with a lot of tech firms that were starting to lead the migration from a, a tape-based, analog-based production world to a digital one. And I became very involved in, in what are the workflows, what are the skills you need, how does this change the way we make movies and, and television. And time passed. I was a studio executive at 20th Century Fox. I was uh, head of BBC technology in the US. And I wasn't actually making movies. So I was spending my time playing music. And then I started painting again. And then I had this idea I wanted to make a film. And my first thought was, I'll just do it all myself. I'll rent an apartment. I'll shoot it super slow over a period of two months you know, a, a page a day. I'll shoot the camera if I have to. I'll run in front of it. You know, I had this idiotic thing. I was just going to do everything. And I quickly realized, just get some help. So I reached out through um, Backstage, where I found Uni, my cameraman. Um, how did I find you? I think it was also Backstage. OK. Yeah. Um, and then I found People Know People. And I got so lucky with the people that you know, tumbled over into other people. And I just found a, a collection of really talented, young, enthusiastic people that were actually still excited about making movies. That it wasn't totally yet about when's lunch and, and do I have to, what's the turnaround? But, you know, that stuff all counts. Yeah. But it was also just a, a, a real rich enthusiasm among my, my crew mm. with making films. And then 
I had somebody uh, starring as the grandmother in The Visit who dropped out like five days before shooting. I didn't know that. And there was this one woman who I saw a reel, and I thought, oh, I'll reach out to her. We talked on the phone. I said, all right, you're in. And that turned out to be uh, Kathy Crystal, who was amazing. And she's been in both my films. She'll be in all my films, I think. And she introduced me to um, Robert Parsons, who then introduced me to Howard. And I realized the community's not that big here. Mm. And the good people kind of rise to the top. They know each other. And yeah. Oh, that's and, and I think you got me half my crew on that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I love, um, I think filmmaking is so much about like community and making art. And I just think that the, the, the crew and cast that you put together for both productions are they're just amazing, so you did really well with that. For the other film, for The Visit, what would your dream cast be for that uh, production? I really wanted to shoot that with like real people, non-actors. I, I wanted to go to Cleveland, rent an apartment, and find a 450 pound man. I wanted to find a 325 pound woman, um, an actual, you know, disabled blind guy. I wanted my characters to, to be from the street. Um, th they don't do a lot of acting in the film. I mean, the, the, the young girl does kind of most of the acting because it's through her point of view. Everybody else is almost threatening in their, um, their stillness. And I've thought about shooting the movie again and going back and doing it the way I intended to the first time. I like it the way it is. But I would love to do it kind of the way I originally thought of doing it. Yeah. It's really gritty. I'd like to shoot it in 16 millimeter black and white film. I'd like to shoot it again, probably by myself. Yeah. And um, the um the the music in that is so good, though. I feel like that would be the thing that like, ugh, how would you get that from? I yeah. So for uh, the, the sound student, stuff yeah. was was, what what makes that film? I yeah. Think. The yeah. music, the sound design. We spent a, as much time or more on the sound stuff than on the visual stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would want to bring all that back. But visually, I just would like to get it really raw and, and you know, sort of the artificialness that happens. Is that a word? <laughs> that happens, you know, when you, when you do actors and you do apply a lot of complex makeup, which was very well done. But... Um, but still, it's not the same as, as sort of these real people in that mm. position. Yeah. Did you have any um, obstacles that you overcame during the filming of Pretzel Logic? So Pretzel Logic was a monsoon. I mean, the night we were shooting, I don't know if you remember, the early winter this year was just insane rain. And the day we went to shoot it, it said rain in the script. <laughs> well... Somebody, the, somebody the was listening. The bomb was that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it was nuts. So at one point, we have light, you know, we're, it was a daytime scene, but it had gotten to be night, so we're shooting looking away from the windows, and we have lights outside with rain hats, and it is just coming down, and one of the rain hats goes flying, the lights go flying. So now we have my crew, who are working for, like, literally peanuts, are outside in this monsoon standing on the lights holding them down i mean you know my heart went out to these guys because you know they they made the movie happen we, yeah. we could have walked away but but no, these guys went out there so that was i don't know if you call that a happy accident or, <laughs> well, i guess an it obstacle. depends if you were <laughs> inside or outside <laughs> definitely an obstacle definitely. yeah that was a great moment um because i think to talk about like a community of filmmakers coming together to really support each other. Like we were filming and it just went dark all of a sudden because yeah. it was dark outside because the rain was so heavy. And and then, yeah, everyone just like snapped to it. To yeah, I mean, you, we were shooting in Sonoma. You couldn't even drive home that night. You had to drive to Napa and then circle around just to get home. Yeah, yeah. What was your inspiration for uh, the See, the music sequence with um, Amazing Grace layered over top of House of the Rising Sun. That was very musically interesting, and I know that you're a musician, so I'm very excited to hear about this. Yeah, the, um, my original choice for that music was a, a tune called Wade in the Water, and it's an old sort of slave spiritual, 
and I, it, it's so soulful and sad. And I was really stuck on that. And then I had a couple friends say to me, you know, it's, it's maybe not appropriate right now. It's kind of appropriation to, to take this song and to this other context. And I really kind of fought against it. So I found this woman who, who sings it on YouTube, and it's beautiful. Her name is something Mixon, Cynthia Mixon, I think. And I wrote to her, and I said, I really want to use this in my film. I sent her the storyboard. What do you think? And she goes, eh, considering your film takes place in like the early 60s, and your cast is white, maybe not. Mm. So I accepted that as truth. And I um, I'd played with it, I struggled with it, and I'd played with a band where the singer once said, start playing House of the Rising Sun. So that's what we started playing, and she started singing Amazing Grace. And I was floored. I thought, that is so beautiful. Yeah. And that kind of, I went back to that, and I thought, okay, but what if I mash different characters singing different lyrics? And so musically, I don't know a lot about music theory, but for Amazing Grace to fit overlapped with House of the Rising Sun, you'd have to like switch it to a different key. It needs to be like minor? Yeah, maybe? it's the same chord progression. Oh, it's the same. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, anyway, it's just beautiful. Yeah. It's It makes it, it sound if, so if solemn. If you learn any three chords, you can play like 3,000 songs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So for um, The Visit, um, was there any moment similar to the monsoon in Fretzel Logic? Was there any moment where you had like an obstacle that your crew really like snapped together to overcome, or um, anyone in particular that you're like they really like came through in this moment? Yeah, for the visit, the biggest obstacle was was the <laughs> the biggest obstacle first was the television because I couldn't find a, a television from the era that I wanted. So I ended up building one out of an old dresser that I bought for 20 bucks, and I kind of carved the tube out of foam. And that, that took me a month to make <laughs> this fake television. So that was the first obstacle. The second obstacle was the car. So I got a car that barely ran, and I had to drive it from uh, the San Rafael Bridge to Piedmont in like Sunday late morning rush hour. And while we were shooting, it had stalled, like, literally every shot. So I'm driving down the middle of traffic, surrounded by cars, riding the, the, the handbrake, the, the shifter, trying to throw it into neutral, rev it up, throw it back <laughs> into gear, just pouring sweat. So the car was a huge obstacle, but we got the shot, and I finally stalled as I was rolling off the Broadway exit into Piedmont, and my producer friend Mark who was following me he just like plowed into the back of me pushed me through the intersection got to the side jumped it again and drove to the next location and then the the third obstacle on the visit was the makeup I mean making these characters feel believable like somebody who they weren't I mean I, I had to add hundreds of pounds to an actor I had to make a guy uh, blind who's not blind and never been Kathy, who's a lovely woman, I had to make her feel kind of visually hideous. And I had this fabulous makeup artist who, who saved the day and really helped them and me make these characters believable. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, the actors all really fell into their, into their roles and styling as well. Yeah, and, um, and Uni, the DP, you know, he, he helped with you know, the way we, we played light on these people. Yeah. So it was a group effort, but certainly the makeup. They had to walk on believing they were these characters. And Great. Um, I'd like to talk about another thing for the visit. Um, that's definitely a period piece, as you were mentioning. Um, what were some of like the small like, or big props and uh, details making it, like inserting it into that time um, that you're like most proud of or that were also hard to acquire? Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, uh, Charles chips were all the rage in the Midwest, so I had to get a can of those, so I ordered that. The next thing was, and filmmakers, I'm going to give you the big, biggest tip I could possibly give you, nextdoor.com. You can get amazing, that's where I got the 1950s car. I got three of them offered to me. I mean, I, I just list stuff on, and then uh, Colleen Gallagher, 
um, responded to the next door thing. I was looking for a Catholic girl school outfit. And she goes, what else do you need? And she just started getting me all this stuff. So, And then, of course, I wanted, like, two-tone shoes. So that was a thrift store and a can of spray paint to make mm -hmm. those. And so a combination of make-it-yourself, nextdoor.com, I got, you know, old cigarette lighter, um, the, the, the 1950s suit and the hat and the clock on the wall. And so... What were some of your biggest challenges working with a child actor? Because she was in like almost every shot. I know. got so lucky. So <laughs> the, the story of Amelia, this actress, is, uh, is an interesting one. So I'm playing in a band. We're literally standing on stage waiting to go on. I'm the bass player, and Joe Heavey, who was my composer, became my composer, but we had no previous relationship other than we played in the same band, and he was a drummer. And he's like, so what are you up to? And I said, I'm making this movie. And I said, you know, I, your daughter's like in this like nine years range. So we talked about her and he goes, you know, I know some, I don't think she's ready, but I know somebody who'd be perfect. So it turns out she's leaving in two days for Brazil for like three weeks. She gets back, she's got COVID. So I still haven't seen her. We're now a couple days before the shoot. I talked to her on the phone, her and her mother, and that was it. She showed up on set. I'd never wow. actually seen her before. We'd never talked in person. And fortunately, the film has no dialogue. And if you were to watch the film with the original audio track, it's just me yakking over the whole track. So I would s just talk to her the whole time we were shooting. I'd say, okay, Amelia, I want you to look over here slowly. You're sad. And she was just, she was so pliable. And she just, like, would listen to me. She would bring, you know, herself into this character, and I just got super lucky. Mitchell, what was your inspiration for uh, the visit? So my father was very sick. He was in South Carolina. I was going to see him for what would be the last time. And I was talking with my wife, who also grew up in Cleveland the night before I left, and she was talking about going to see her grandmother, who she was terrified of who lived with her very large uncle and that they always had a border in the house. And she's telling me these stories and sort of this visceral fear, fear of this young child of her relatives. And um, nothing ever happened, but they were just so scary. And her father would, would take her there. So I thought, okay, well, what if he drops her off? So I went to see my dad and I was just sat at his kitchen table because he wasn't capable of doing a lot. And I just started drawing pictures of this. And I ended up drawing the whole film. And there weren't any words. It was just a, a series of pictures that told the story of this young child being around people that are family, but they're not familiar. And the environment seemed very scary. And that ultimately, though it's not a true story, that was the inspiration. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm very excited to see your films again at uh, the Timeless Film Festival. Do you know what you're going to wear? Um, I'm definitely going to wear something clean. <laughs> All right, I'm well, break out some of the clean clothes. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there um, on July 8th. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. Yeah, and thanks to, to you and to Jordan for including my film in this. You know, it's, it's so cool to be involved in, in something like this locally. and being able to invite the cast and crew and to celebrate what we did together with a community of other people that have gone down a similar path and, and in such a supportive environment. So, Great. yeah, it's excited. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm hoping everybody will come out to Tilly on July 8th and see my films and see the films of these other filmmakers because I think we're going to have a really good time and I think we're going to see some great work. So I hope to see you there. Come up and introduce yourself.